57. 57 completely unique ships in game. 100 if you include the variants. Sure, in real life there'd be hundreds of ships, but in a finite game with incredibly detailed interiors and unique use cases, that's a lot. And at some point ships need to become specialized, useful to a specific type of entrepreneur, fighter, or industrial mogul. Ships like the Argo Mole or the Drake Vulture. The profession ships. And one of the first places haulers of all kinds of cargo go for ships is Crusader Industries. And if you're interested in vehicles and cargo, you're interested in the Hercules. This is the Crusader Hercules Starlifter Tour and Review, presented by Space Tomato. And I'm going to tell you why this ship nails its role, which means most people will never need to get one. And at the end, I'm going to explain how you can enter my giveaway to win either one of these Hercules variants, a Drake Cutlass Starter Pack, or a Mustang Alpha Starter Pack. Thank you for coming to my tomato talk. While this ship model does represent three separate variants, I will be sticking with the C2 for this review, with referrals to the M2 where possible. The A2 has not yet been released. We begin this journey, as always, outside. And immediately the design of the ship stands out as something familiar, very akin to large air transport vehicles of today. The community has settled on a few different planes which closely resemble the ship in function, such as the C5 Galaxy. And while the design is truly beautiful with the same two-tone dark grey and white color scheme that we see on the Star Runner, it takes what I feel is a more pedestrian design than its little brother. While the ship at launch suffers from a tipping problem similar to the Constellation, this shouldn't be a problem in the future. Now as we move around the ship, you'll notice some very cheeky geometry added to the ship to add to the silhouette. Some of this added geometry is dynamic, revealing a VTOL mode which allows this rather large vehicle to have an easier time delivering payloads to planetary surfaces. The wings are also split as a callback to the design of the older brother, the Genesis Starliner. While the design of the ship is a bit different from the concept, it overall rings pretty true. It manages to wrap a large amount of storage into a relatively small, good-looking armored package. And it can defend itself. On the C2 base variant, you'll be getting two size 4 remote turrets and two size 5 hardpoints for the pilot. The M2 comes with an extra turret. But for both ships, not all turrets can be manned at the same time. It's a beautiful ship covered in panels which fit together at the seams to present a white body broken only by a few lines. The pill-shaped thrusters are familiar to Crusader fans, and I actually like that there's a group of small thrusters on the back rather than a couple of large ones. The contrast across the body in different areas is appreciated as it was on the MSR, though I do feel there was some room for more. While I love the exterior of the ship, there is something that feels off to me every once in a while. Now, moving underneath the ship, we will see there are three ways to enter. A service elevator, an aft ramp, and a fore ramp. All of these openings allow you to access the lower deck with elevator access to the upper deck. Of course, for whatever reason, the elevator buttons are again close to 6 meters overhead. So, be persistent in pressing them. And we'll see how this persistent issue is solved. Now as we move inside of the ship, let's take a step back and consider its design. At this point, many followers of the game know the design language of Crusader Industries fairly well. Each company in-game, whether that be a weapons manufacturer, a clothing provider, an outpost creator, or a ship manufacturer, they all have a backstory, a mission statement, and a design language. Crusader seems to keep it sleek and clean while also maintaining a rather busy design, affording some of the more clean habits you might find in an Anvil or Aegis ship while putting on display some more mechanical and exposed areas like you might find on a ship from RSI or Drake Interplanetary. 
Still, here are the circular bulkheads, translating chairs, 30 and 60 degree angles, and large uninterrupted light strips. And of course, the thrusters out back. But with a ship coming in at 94 meters long compared to the 56 meter long Mercury Star Runner, you start to get more explorations of ship architecture. Some of the interesting bits here are what I can only assume is a view into the exhaust path leaving the back of the ship. It just seems like a star back there. The whole area is nothing but ship dressing, but it's pretty cool and leaves some room for the imagination, and could have been a much more boring presentation. Though I do hope that there's some lore explanation to what's going on here. The way the hallway tapers to the door up front leading to the bridge is also a little weird to me. It works, but it's just a bit strange. But these are all things that you will see and notice as we walk around the ship together. But keep an eye out for these small design elements, they're fun to notice as you explore different ships. The lower deck is entirely dominated by the cargo bay in the C2 and the M2, with the A2 also including bomb deployment zones. While this space is enough for three tanks, it is only meant for two. Plenty of cargo and other types of vehicles can also be hauled up here, though I would be wary how this ship might perform flying solely with cargo. The C2, as of its release, carries 696 SCU. The M2 suffers some cargo capacity against the C2 with only 522 at release apparently because it will have heavier armor and resistance to damage. It is here in the lower deck where we begin to already see some similarities with the smaller MSR. The long light strips and clean detail lights are clearly pulled from the same book. There are two ramps leading up into this lower deck, but to get any further into the ship, we'll either have to hop on that same elevator that went down to the ground, or use the nearby access ladder. This elevator is nicer than previous iterations in that it is sealed separately from other decks. Much like the lower deck, it isn't quite spartan, but does remain without embellishments or features of comfort. And continuing to the upper deck will afford more of the same. Arriving on the top deck, we're met with another open space with quite a bit going on. While thinner than the deck below, it provides more breathing room than one should take for granted on a spaceship. The area is dominated by a central spine consisting of storage containers and walkways. And while these containers are interactable now, there's no emphasizing enough how useful these will be in the future. Moving aft, we come to a lot of bright lights, glowing wires, and engine looking bits that, if nothing else, make for quite the exciting spectacle. And while the functionality of those points is in question, the nearby components are screaming for attention, as they will be a frequent stop for engineers on a ship like this. That being said, you'll find components scattered elsewhere throughout this deck while walking around, as they're not all centralized. Unlike the smaller MSR, the Hercules does not have a dedicated room for engineering. As one can expect, the room is mirrored across the other side, so we'll continue our tour by moving into the adjacent rooms. These are simple accommodations. Habitation is quite reminiscent of the smaller Star Runner, simply taking the same design and expanding it for larger crew. Still, though, rather personal. There are some nice things here, like these extra lockers you'll find on both sides of the room and these bags hanging on the wall just as in the MSR. Otherwise, this area is rather simple and sparse. Across the way is a recreation space, which is nothing to write home about. It's a small area, not particularly inviting, but just friendly enough for somebody to hang out in during work breaks. This goes with the theme, it seems, of keeping things simple, straightforward, and to the point. This is also where the M2 differs quite a bit. The M2 contains an auxiliary crew room instead of a recreation area. As a military-focused transport, it is meant to bring troops, supplies, and vehicles to forward operating bases and other strategic locations. Thus, it is equipped with jump seats, an entire armory for your crew. There is also a bench here for whatever reason, and plenty of additional storage for weapons, suits, and supplies.
from here we can move back through the main room and into the neck of the ship. This segment houses some more components, with your power supplies and shield generators both being in the first segment on either side of the hall. In the next room you have a weapons rack, a suit rack, and an escape pod, ready just outside of the cockpit on the C2, and multiple escape pods on the M2. Inside of the bridge is an incredibly pleasing iteration on the MSR cockpit. Borrowing light strips, sliding chairs, exposed geometry, and other design cues from the smaller ship, and building one of a cooler and less claustrophobic design. This design, aesthetically speaking, is a masterpiece, in my opinion. Functionally speaking, it is also quite useful, but not without flaws. The buttons all seem to be in easy to reach places, and both pilots get quite a nice view, but the downward facing view is still quite lacking on a ship of this size. The bridge is also quite defensible, with multiple doors and accommodations close at hand, but the use of space is questionable. Then again, what else might be needed in here? There are several features throughout the cockpit, such as what I can guess is flight and avionic system slots, as well as what could be other functional ship parts which remind me of what we see out in the hallway in the escape pod. There are two screens which I imagine can be used by a crewmate, but likely only in situations in which standing is reasonable. Otherwise, where are the chairs? On the M2 here you do have an extra seat for an additional turret gunner. And of course the bridge has the odd little compartment here and there, likely to make for useful little storage locations later. Speaking performance, in the air this ship is a breeze to fly, no pun intended. It feels almost too easy at times, and while the ease of flying a ship like this in air should be emphasized compared to, say, a hull C, it should also still be something uncomfortable to wield. In space is where the movement feels weird. Without air resistance, this thing can flip, turn, stop, and start all very quickly. It can roll quite easily as well. This all feels a bit off to me, but it's really hard to know what will be expected until all ships begin to be balanced and finalized with capacitors, the pipe system, and true thruster efficiency curves. Now, as I've mentioned throughout this review, this is a ship for a job, both in function and design. If you're looking for a nice multi-crew ship to ride around and do all your missions in, this is likely not it. If you want pleasant living areas and comfortable long-term accommodations, this ain't it. This ship is built to haul cargo, vehicles, and sometimes people. And if you aren't doing those things, it's not a great ship. Your efforts are better spent elsewhere. If you are into those things though, then this very well could be for you. Transporting vehicles and cargo will prove to be much easier in one of the most agile and maneuverable cargo ships in atmosphere. With a flight model that takes into account ship shape, this is important. It also features adequate defenses, VTOL thrusters for an easier time landing and taking off, and a really nice design, let's be honest. There is no best cargo ship. I'll never say there is. But in the size class, it's hard to go wrong with this ship when carrying around large things. Now that the important part is done, let's get to the fun part. If you're still here, you want to win a ship. When this YouTube channel hits 25,000 subscribers, I will be giving away three. A Hercules Starlifter with lifetime insurance and the full Star Citizen game, a Cutlass Black with the full Star Citizen game, and a Mustang Alpha with the full game. All rolled in that order. The rules are simple. Use the link below to enter via any of the listed means, and keep an eye out for secret codes. Over the months leading up to this giveaway, there will be a series of codes shared across social media every week that will give you additional entries into the giveaway. So stay active for the best chance at winning, and you can either check the link or my Discord server for more details if you are having trouble understanding. Oh, and go back and check this video for the first code, it's in there somewhere. Of course, you can also subscribe for more content in the future and support these giveaways and videos on Patreon. As always, thanks so much for giving your time and attention, and I'll see you in the next one.